Today's episode is brought to you by Patreon sponsor Al Smith of the Philadelphia Smiths. If you'd like to know how you can support the podcast through a small monthly donation, please visit schooloflaughs.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thanks, Al. That right there will wear a young man out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by SchoolofLaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast. Rick Roberts here. And I'm excited about today's episode because we kind of flipped the script. I got interviewed by Rick Altizer. If you don't know Rick, Rick is a uh, film director. He's a jingle writer. He's a songwriter. He's a musician. He's a director, producer. Produced Shonda Pierce's uh, first movie and is now working on her second one. And that movie uh, did very well at the box office on its limited run. Uh, just an all-around good guy. He's got a radio show here in Nashville called The Rick Altizer Show. And he had me on it recently. And, in fact, that one airs this Sunday. So he interviewed me a while back. It airs this Sunday. So I thought I'd put out that same interview. But on my podcast, you guys can learn a little bit about Rick Altizer. And if you like his interview style, look him up online. You'll find his show listed there. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That will air here in just a few seconds. And uh, you'll kind of hear some questions he asked that may come from your same perspective. You know, he knows comedians but doesn't know specifically about comedy techniques. And we break down a couple things in the podcast. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Also, if you're in the Nashville area, I do want to let you know October 11th we will have our final graduation show of 2016 at Zany's Comedy Club. Uh, this will showcase students that took my writing and performing classes this past year and it's going to be a bunch of students, a lot. It's going to be a cattle call, man. We're going to have every kind of style and type of comedy you can possibly imagine. Uh, the ages on the students probably runs from 20 to, uh, I'd say, 62 or something like that, all across the board. going to be a lot of fun. Again, that's at Zany's, October 11th. That's a Tuesday. Uh, 7.30 show. Doors open at 6.30. Tickets are $10 if you reserve in advance. So check that out. Also, if you think you want to take a class before the end of the year, November 7, 21, and 28, those three days will consist of the writing class. The last writing class, actually the final class of the year for school last. We'll meet those Mondays here in Nashville between 6 and 8 p.m. on the 7th, 21st, and 28th of November. If you want to get in on that, shoot me an email, schooloflast at gmail.com, and I will save your spot. All right, enough of that business for now. Let's jump right into the interview with my good friend, Rick Altizer. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining me today. I have a special guest that's awfully special to me because uh, he's actually a personal friend. And, uh, and you've we, only got three. And I've got three. <laughs> and he said he'd do it. Uh, my guest today is a professional comedian, Rick Roberts. Rick has been a professional comedian for 25 years. If you listen to the uh, comedy stations on satellite radio, you have probably heard him. He's on there all the time. He's been on CMT, GAC, which, which is GAC. Which GAC great Rico, American country. Greg GAC. Um, we'll just leave it at that. The Dove <laughs> Network. Working on a Pure Flix comedy show, DVD now. He is currently the president of the CCA, the Christian Comedy Association. It's either that or comedian. We're not sure. He's, uh, why aren't we sure, Rick? Because I've never got a check. It's all volunteer. <laughs> so uh, you, you make as much as I do as the president of the Christian Comedy Association. <laughs> so he's the president of the Christian Comedy Association, started by Sean Pierce, And he also teaches uh, the School of Laughs. It's an online school uh, where you can get information there. Uh, also, uh, he teaches in Nashville. Uh, and it's from page to stage. So he teaches comedians how to be funny. Uh, so uh, he's, he coaches comedians on their writing, delivery. And uh, so let's, let's start out. I'd like to start out, Rick. Um, you're a, a Christian comedian, and yes, uh, I had Johnny W. on last week, uh, another Christian comedian. And I'd like to get your definition on what does that mean? Uh, you know, there's always a raging debate at the CCA as to what that means exactly. And I think it means to whatever God puts on your heart in that sense, you know. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian since uh, teenage years, you know, gave my life. Had a few strays, you know, growing up just like everybody does, but got back to it, especially once I had my family, got married and all that, realized that God was the rock to put my feet upon. And at the same time, you know, my comedy 
probably at the beginning wasn't squeaky clean. It was just what I thought was funny. But then as I got into it more, I realized that, you know, I am a Christian. I am a comedian. And everything I do on stage reflects that. And so if I'm not shining the light the correct way to any group, then I'm not reflecting what God's shining on me. So for me, a Christian comic is somebody who's not only clean on stage, but also kind of gives a glimmer of, you know, that, that un, intangible thing where an audience member might come to you after the show and go, you know, there's something different about you. And that's where I like to start my conversations. Whereas other comics, Christian comics who I might call church comedians, that only perform in front of church groups and don't go out to the clubs or do corporate events or what have you, they will do more jokes about the church itself. They might do more jokes about the church nursery. or Sometimes the comics that I see will also make fun of other types of religions within Christianity just because their church is a little bit different than theirs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's funny. For me, I never wanted to uh, put too much pressure on separating what's within the church because I think the church has enough trouble staying together as it is. So my comedy is Christian clean. I perform at churches, but I don't necessarily preach. Um, you know, I don't do bits about Noah's Ark and all that kind of stuff to you know poke fun at that. So that's kind of a roundabout answer. That's maybe not an answer at all. So what does that answer mean to you? <laughs> so you'll you'll do corporate events, you'll do clubs mm -hmm. as well as churches, but you don't do a, a salvation message at the end of your comedy bit. Well. At churches, I'm more than happy to do that. You know, I'm ha more than happy to talk about my journey. I always say at churches, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. And at corporate events, I'm not trying to convert you. You know, I respect whatever somebody hires me for. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the Bible's pretty clear on follow the rules that are in front of you, you know, and respect those rules. So if somebody asks me not to uh, speak about something, then I won't. And if, if it's to the point where they're really adamant about it, that they're walking on eggshells and they're afraid, I'll just say, I'm probably not the right guy for you if you don't think... You know, my show is really, 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 really clean mm -hmm. and super politically correct. So if, if they look at me and think this guy could go off either direction on us, then I'm definitely not the guy for them. They probably don't need comedy at all. <laughs> they, probably, <laughs> they probably need a magician or a hypnotist or something like that, maybe a cartoonist. I don't know. So what do you like about comedy? I like the challenge of every crowd is different. And even though I have you know, probably two hours worth of material to pull from, that's... I've got more than that, but at the ready is about two hours, if that makes sense. You know, I've got a lot of songs I don't play anymore, I don't remember. But for each group, I've got to kind of dial in the correct show for them. And you can, you, uh, with pre-event planning, you can figure out a lot about that. You know, and from watching performers before you, if there's multiple performers, multiple performers, I'll watch them and see what's working and what's not. But you really have 10 to 15 minutes in a one-hour show to kind of figure it out. And... <laughs> And that's like the max. If you haven't figured out by 10 or 15, you're pretty much sunk. So <laughs> within my first two or three jokes, I try to figure out where's their level of you know looseness and how fun are they going to be and meet them right there. So when you're saying figure it out, you're talking about you're trying to read the audience. Some audiences laugh at certain jokes and yes. other audiences laugh at other kinds of jokes. And you're trying to figure out, I got two hours of material here. I'm doing a 45-minute set. I'm trying to figure right. out which part of my two hours I'm going to do tonight that they'll respond to the most. Yeah, I want to pick the absolute best. And I might leave something on the table and, and afterwards, like, well, it probably could have worked, but I'm always going to put in what I think is going to work best. Because that's what they're really hiring me to do is come in and entertain, give them a, a relaxing time, you know, a time away from worries and away from struggle and all that. And so you, you teach comedy. You have, uh, you have an online course. Where can people go to get information on your online course? Everything about my comedy class is at schooloflast.com, and that's all spelled correctly. You know, okay, school so School of, of Laughs. Laughs. They can, if they want more information, they can go to schooloflast.com. And talk to me a little about, about coaching comedy, how you've, you've been a professional comedian for 25 years, and now you're teaching people how to coach, uh, I mean, how to, how to do comedy. Talk to me a little bit about that transition and how that came about. Well, when I moved to Nashville in 2000, uh, the comedy club here was run at that time and still is by Brian Dorfman, a good friend of mine. And he said, Rick, you know, I, I like your comedy. You're new to town. Listen, if you want to teach some comedy classes, it would help me out because we have these open mics and people go up for five or six minutes and they're just all over the place. They have no idea what a joke is. Can you teach them that? And then my first answer was no. I don't think you can teach people to be funny. Like that's the normal you know, approach mm -hmm. from all comedians. Like it's something you got to yank, you know. And he said, well, why don't you just look at your act, take some time, and figure out why people are laughing at your jokes. Make some notes and teach that. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting. 
So at the time, I was pretty much a feature act in comedy clubs, which is a 30-minute set. You're in between the opener and the headliner. And after going through my set and learning, finally, for the first time, and I was already 10 years into it at that point, and I was successful as far as being a full-time comedian, but I really didn't know why people were laughing. If something worked, I just did it again. So I started to break it down and learn that there's about 15 or 16 techniques that I use that make people laugh. And the jokes I had at that time that were 50-50, sometimes they would work, sometimes they didn't, had zero techniques in them. They just had like a, what I thought was funny, but there wasn't any actual trigger to make people laugh. So I isolated those and started... What's a, if you don't mind me interrupting, what sure. is a, give me an example of a trigger. Help. Okay. Um, alliteration is a technique. So if I, have, if I have a joke about driving across Kansas, I could say it's flat. Or I could say, it's a flat, cracked slab of asphalt. And that just sounds funny, right? It's got <laughs> flat, cracked, you know, it's, a, it's that succession of, of words mm-hmm. that sound the same. I might say uh, a different technique would be a reversal. So, you know, you just take a common phrase and flip it using almost the exact same words. You might add one word or two to make it happen. So I might say, it's cold outside. Or I could say, it's so cold I saw a flagpole licking a kid. <laughs> right. Right? So that's okay. a trigger. Um, and you can layer those triggers, which I just did there. Licking a kid is also alliteration. K-k-k. Licking wow. a kid. So what I found was jokes that had multiple triggers in the punchline almost always worked. In fact, they always did. You know, so I would go back and look at jokes that just had one trigger and see if I could layer a second and third on top of it. So that's one thing I teach. The other thing I also teach are to go deeper with a joke as opposed to just to the initial joke, see how far you can take it. What do you mean by that? You, I could say, um, you know, my kid came up to me the other day and said, Papa, we look alike. I'm like, really? I said, what do you think about that? He goes, what am I, what am I going to do? Like he realizes that he looks like me, <laughs> poor kid. And so I could leave it at that, Uh or I could take it further. Well, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're probably going to go to bed early tonight. (laughs) And you don't need your nightlight anymore. I'm going to close the door all the way, you know. (laughs) And so you can just put yourself in the moment where something occurs and see what would happen next. Almost like a sitcom writer would say, you know, where would would this scene go? Or an improv actor would say, you know, how can we make it bigger, weirder, or stranger? And just explore that. Sometimes the crowd doesn't go with you on that journey, and so you take it a different place. But if you don't try it, you're just leaving yourself with a one-liner. And you have to have a lot of one-liners to do an hour. I mean, probably 500. So I can't remember 500 individual little snippets, but I can remember bits and pieces and, and routines and that's, stack those together. That's so interesting, the, the cerebral approach to comedy writing. You never think, we just sit and listen to somebody and go, oh, I think that's funny. I, I saw you at one of the CCA conventions, and, and I thought, uh, or conferences, and I thought he's just really funny. You you did that whole thing about the post-it note and the, uh, and the, yeah, the yeah. single man. It, single guys have all the stress. They got to wake up every day, figure out where they're going to go, what they're going to do, when they <laughs> should be done. Once you get married, don't have to make any of those decisions again. You know, I wake up every morning. My wife's got a post-it note stapled into my forehead. I'll see you after Home Depot. All right. <laughs> She's my little GPS, my global pestering system. <laughs> <laughs> so you had this whole thing about when you get married. And the one thing you said, I remember I reminded you of, you go, i got to remember that. You go, a young man, he's got to get up every day and figure out what he's going to do and where he's going to go and when he's going to get there. You go, that right there will wear a young man out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? yeah. So it's just the way you build. Right. So n- now just having this conversation, I'm seeing how you've built that joke. And, you know, I'm dying laughing because you just, you just told my life. Okay? Right, right. You just described my life. Which is key for any comedian is to relate to the audience in front of them. Right. So I'm sitting there, you know, laughing out loud. I'm the only guy in my row just laughing like that. But you have completely nailed me. Right, right. right. And then you keep going. Right. And you keep nailing me. And it goes on and on. Then it gets absurd. And it's, you know, the post-it note stapled to my head. Right. Then it gets into absurdity. But it's, it, uh, you know, I see how that's, that's built. That's so interesting to see how a joke is built. Do you, do you enjoy the process of creating a joke? I do. Once, you know, it's, it can be tedious if you're forcing yourself to write about something. And I will... I have a book of, I call it my book of inspiration, and sometimes it's on my phone. If I think of something, I'll jot it down, and I'll come back to it when I have time to really focus on it, but I'll let it marinate for a while. You know, a good example is, uh, I remember coming home one time, and it smelled like my wife made a new pot of coffee, and she never made coffee. And I looked around, and there wasn't even a coffee maker on the, like, where is it? And it was just one of those little candles, those Yankee candles. (laughs) 
And so, I, you know, I sit there and I thought, that has, other people have to be fooled by these candles. You know, and she had another one that was like brownies or something like that. And after the third time I've been tricked, I just got so mad I had to write a joke about it. <laughs> and so I, I wrote a joke basically where, and it's evolved now into like a three-minute story, but the original joke was I woke up one morning, smelt some maple syrup and pancakes, and I went downstairs, and she had bought a candle somewhere that smells exactly like maple syrup. <laughs> you have been mad and hungry at 6 a.m. Central? <laughs> you know? So that was like the nugget of the original joke, and it, I tested it in front of a crowd, and it worked. And then I thought, how could this, that's a funny thing, but how can that be more meaningful than just a little thing? So then I worked it into a story about communication between me and my wife, mm. and a Valentine's Day uh, discussion that we had where I said, hey, what can I get you for Valentine's Day? I'm out of ideas. been married for so long, I've got you everything I can think of. And she says, how about instead of exchanging gifts this year, We'll exchange ideas to each other on a piece of paper instead. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I'll write down something you're not doing right around the house, and you write down a couple things about me. And I'm like, stop right there. That's like a trap door on an escalator. You know it's coming, you just don't know when. I say, so you want me and you to, ex-, you know. So the whole thing is like, we're going to tell each other what we don't like about each other, which is a funny situation. Right. It's a sitcom type situation. Right. So she, you know, she tells me that I don't fix things around the house quick enough, and she asked me what I think about her and what she's doing wrong. And I say, honey, I, you're doing everything great, but the one thing I miss before we had our kids 11 years ago, you'd make me this big surprise breakfast if I wasn't traveling. If I was home on Saturday, it was like tractor barrel in the house. Mm-hmm. I said, I kind of missed that. And she goes, well, maybe one day I'll cook for you again. So the next morning is when I smell the maple syrup and the pancakes. Uh-huh. And now it takes on a whole bigger meaning because... Mm. You know, I think she's doing something for me that she's not. Mm-hmm. With you know, we had this discussion at Valentine's, and we're going to make these changes, and so it builds it up better. I couldn't have started the story that way and put a Yankee Candle in there <clears throat> automatically. It had to start with that first smell of that you know coffee maker candle mm-hmm. and work myself backwards. And that whole you know between the initial joke and the joke now, which that's an abbreviated version that I just did for you. it's about a three minute thing. That took about nine months. To write a three-minute piece. Yeah, and to perform it and to tweak it and to fine-tune it. Wow. So, but, but it's interesting that this is fascinating, you know, that we're, we're, we're learning how a comedian crafts and does what he does. I just, I just love this. Well, that's so, what keeps it going for me is it, it's always like a, it's, it's a fortune cookie. You keep opening it and the answer is different every day. Yeah, the cookie tastes the same, uh-huh. but the message inside is different. That's great. And for those just joining me, I'm with uh, uh, comedian Rick Roberts, and we're talking about the construction of comedy, uh, how we make, how we write comedy. So back to your story about the the maple syrup. I thought that was really interesting that you you had the joke, you had you you had actually been fooled with a candle that smelled like something you thought was being cooked or whatever, and and you turn it into this other story. But you turned it into a marriage relationship issue, which is something we all connect with. So do right. you see that as like that's your goal? It's when you can find something people can relate to, that's, my, that's where you hit the hardest with laughs? I think so because it has multi, multiple layers to it. You know, I could just do the one joke and it could connect to anybody that's ever smelled a candle. But now the people who connect with that joke will never smell a candle again without thinking of my comedy show. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, every time they walk past the, in a Cracker Barrel, they've got those candles over in the corner. They're going to sniff that and remember the joke. You know, they might play that joke. Maybe I'm, I'm curious if anybody's went home and the next day lit up a candle to, to fool their spouse. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? I wonder if I could sell candles after the show. That's what I'm wondering now. <laughs> Rick's, Make, yeah. Yeah, make it a whole thing. Like it's like a candle thing, a little t shirt, you know, with a candle on it. Yeah. You know? Well, let's go back to what we were talking about earlier, you, taking things further, right? Mm-hmm. So that story could end right there, right? Mm-hmm. But where can we take it again? I, she tricked me with a smell. So the extension of that joke is my son sees what happens and she la- my wife laughs and my son's like, Papa, she got you good. We got to get her back. Mm-hmm. So now we turn the tables, which is another comedy technique. And now we're going to trick her with a smell. She wanted me to fix stuff around the house better, so my son says, you know, she tricked you with a smell like she was cooking. we got to trick her with a smell like we're fixing something. And so I let that sit for a while. Nobody can think of what that smell is, right? Mm -hmm. WD-40. Okay. So then the the extension of the story is I have my son uh, hang out with my wife after church and and go to grocery shopping with her, and I go back to the house tell my wife I'm going to fix something. So I get WD-40, and I spray it all over the house. 
And my wife walks in. She's like, did you finally fix something around here? I'm like, yeah, that griddle was supposed to make my pancakes a few weeks ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, okay, so then but, you turn it. Yeah, because she got me, she's fair game. If I started uh-huh. out with the joke of me making fun of her, it wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. I have to make make sure she makes me a victim first in the in the material that I come back at her. Mm-hmm. And so that's just an extension of taking it further. And I've heard that there's uh, making yourself the joke as opposed to someone else. Yeah, self-deprecating, which some comics are, you know, I think sometimes comics go overboard with that. Like you have to get on stage and you go, I'm ugly, I'm hideous, I'm, I sound horrible, you know. Don't beat yourself so much up that the audience doesn't respect you anymore. Mm-hmm. But you can point out the obvious for sure. I mean, if you're like seven foot tall and you've got spiked hair and tattoos, you might want to say something about it before the audience does. Mm-hmm. They're expecting you to say something. If not, you just you put a barrier between you and the audience. They're like, why isn't he saying something about that? You know, so that kind of self-deprecating thing goes. Uh, it, it's a great way to endear the audience to you really quickly. And up front, the audience has to take your word on you. You're an authority on you. So if I say something about me, they have to trust that. Once they trust me, I can talk about other subjects. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Henry Cho, a clean comic here in Nashville, you know, he's, he's Korean, but he's from Knoxville. So when he talks, he sounds like a Southerner. And he has a, a, two or three great opening jokes about that. But he only does two or three because once they get it, they get it. Mm-hmm. And he can move on. Mm-hmm. Now, some comics go the entire hour with it. You know, Rodney Dangerfield, I get no respect. He turned it into a whole thing. Mm-hmm. But he still had different types of jokes throughout that hour to make it happen. And he seemed to be, though, kind of just a one-liner guy. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Rodney was a guy who worked, worked his life as an aluminum siding salesman. And then I think he was in his late 30s before he even started comedy. So he actually he developed his style. A lot of comics wrote for him. He bought a lot of material. But it all fit that context of I, I get no respect. So do you enjoy teaching other comedians? Do you enjoy the act, just the, the process of, of teaching and communicating with comedians? Yeah. It's, well, for new comedians, I love it because I can see the light bulbs going off for the first time, just like we were having here, like, oh, that's why that works. And, and when I see him put that into use and start using those techniques, what's fun for me is they can see that they can use these techniques and they don't have to use shock. You know, shock is a technique that's like, I don't even know if it, anything is shocking anymore. Right. In today's world. I mean, right. back in the 80s, it might have been shocking to hear Richard Pryor or somebody for the first time or in the 70s. But now you've heard those words, you've kind of, they're desensitized and you've tuned them out. So I think the shocking thing for people now is to go an hour and go, whoa, wait a second, that guy didn't swear. Mm-hmm. That's shocking. Mm-hmm. You know, so using techniques can, can get the new comedians over that hump. And for comics that have done it for a while, that are kind of struggling, I work with some of them and help them isolate what works for them best and what's holding them back. And that's just something I can see from doing it for so long. And the comedian we had on last week, Johnny W., actually was in your class. Yeah, he'd been doing it just a little while, and his wife got it for him, got my classes for him for a gift. And he he found four or five techniques that he wasn't using, and he started using those. And then how does that make you feel then when you see him now going out on tour with Tim Hawkins and playing in front of thousands of people? And how does that make you feel seeing that one of your students you know, move, move, moving like that. Oh, yeah, it's great. You know, jo- Johnny's a good example. Brian Bates is another guy that took my class. He'd worked for 20-plus years as a news director at Channel 5 here in Nashville. Took the class just to see if he would like writing comedy. Had no intention of even getting on stage. He's been full-time for a year and a half. Wow. You know, so a good little snippet to let your listeners in on, though. From that first class to when he went full time was about eight years of developing material and making, mm-hmm. you know, networking, making contacts, all that. So it's not just about somebody who, oh, that guy's funny. Yeah, you ought to be a comedian. You ought to be on stage. There's there's a lot of technique uh, involved, a lot of work involved. Do you, uh, I, when you're looking for those connect points, do you ever, uh, like, if you're in a church or something, do you ever find ways to connect to somebody and something that maybe has a, a deeper meaning just beyond the joke uh, in, on a spiritual level or, or some kind of something that you're trying to help them grow in their own self? Yeah, you know, what, what I've done the past two or three years, I do these different speeches, you know, motivational speeches and, and different themes. And what I learned from doing those is looking at my comedy and, and almost every joke can fit in another category that's deeper. You know, like that joke about the Yankee Candle. That was about communication. We had a conversation that led to that. And so I can 
connect with people on that level now if they're not communicating with God, I can use a, a joke to kind of get me into that context with them. Mm-hmm. If they're having struggles, I can talk about a struggle with my child or a struggle with a former employer or something like that. So now we're talking about struggle in life. So every joke can lead into an area where somebody's hurting or somebody needs some, some levity. Why do you see comedy as a way of uh, opening those doors? Well, a lot of research I've done in the past three or four years shows the power of humor and the power of laughter. Uh, it's, it's obvious that when you make somebody laugh, they're at ease. They trust you. You know, laughter itself is is a it's it's saying to you, "I understand you." Mm. And so, when somebody laughs and they understand you, they they want to know more. And that could be about any topic. So, getting that first little laugh from somebody, and this is something all of your listeners can do day to day conversation with the people they work with or work for, is to just have a little humor, lighten things up before you have, you know, a heavier talk about a deeper topic. I want to thank you, Rick, for, for coming here and, and just being a part of this, uh, the, for sharing this. It's been fascinating how uh, jokes are made and, and kind of the, the thought behind it. It's been very interesting, and I just appreciate so much you being on the show today. Well, it's been good to be here, sir. Thanks. And, uh, you know, he's... Do you smell that? I do. Is that pancakes and syrup? I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that. It was kind of fun sitting there with Rick Altizer, who I've known for several years. He's helped uh, make some videos for me, him and his son. and He's got so much skill and talent with technology and camera work. It's off the charts. And I've known him for a while, and that was fun to sit down. And he learned a few things about me that he didn't know yet. Maybe you guys did as well. Uh, hopefully it was a is a worth a listen to. Uh, again, if you like Rick Altizer's interview style, I'll link in the show notes to his show, the Rick Altizer Show. And, uh, you know, listen, give him some feedback. He interviews a lot of interesting people, and I think you're going to dig it. You know, before I let you loose today, if you've got one more minute, I just want to read this email that came in from Damian Challen, who's down in Newcastle, Australia. That's right, Newcastle, Australia. He says this, Rick, I was one of your early podcast iTunes reviewers way back around episode 13. I signed up for your online class, and I have to say, within one hour, I knew what my biggest mistake was. Sarcasm. No one, no other book or course told me this. It's 100% true. Most of my material does not have a punchline, but I'm just using my personality and a lot of heavy sarcasm to get by. I've been wondering why my writing is not getting much better and I don't seem to get better on stage. Your course is already changing the way I analyze my joke structure. Thank you once again for doing the podcast and continuing to do it. I'm sure that many thousands have found it and are getting great tips. I love the interviews on how people get started. Those stories are cool. I'm only a little way into the online course, but again, I can see that it will make great strides in my comedy soon. And finally, I think it will help me be a clean comic, too. The way you outline jokes and make and create setups and punchlines with no swearing or real innuendo, it really is showing me that with the right structure, I don't have to swear. It's a real pleasure to email you. Thanks again. Damien Challen from Newcastle West, Australia. Way down under. Hey, Damien. I got to tell you, I was driving to teach a class when I got this email, and at the stoplight, I pulled it up, <clears throat> and I was so fired up because that is one of the biggest mistakes that comedians make is just using sarcasm to try to get their point across. And you know, in a room of 100 like-minded people, that'll work. But the chance that everybody in the room has the same mind as you is slim, and if they did, uh, they would all be on stage too because they've got your same mind. So. Honest feedback like that from you really helps me know what to keep in the course and, you know, what I might need to change. Either way, I thought I'd share that with my listeners. If you've taken the course and you've had some eye-opening moments like Damien, feel free to shoot those in to me so I can share them as well. So, again, thanks, Damien, for not only reviewing the podcast on iTunes, but also reviewing this online course for me and let me know that it's paying off already for you. That's going to do it for me. Again, if you want to join the uh, stand-up writing class in Nashville, it's in November. Shoot me an email, schooloflast at gmail.com. And come out and support the graduation show at Zany's, October 11th, 7.30 p.m. You guys take it easy, stay safe out there, and stay funny. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaps.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money.